Um, so we are very pleased to have with us today in our seminar, Professor Michal Irani from the Weizmann Institute of Science, who is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics. Michal did her undergraduate and graduate studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem with a BSc in Mathematics and Computer Science and an MSc and PhD in Computer Science. Following that, she joined and was a member of the Vision Technologies Laboratory at the Sarnoff Research Center in Princeton. She then joined the Weizmann, Weizmann Institute. Her research focuses on computer vision and even more specifically video information analysis. She investigates image processing from the machine's point of view, also known as computer vision, but with an emphasis, emphasis on dynamic stimuli. She developed and develops groundbreaking novel techniques to approach and handle video analyses, incorporating artificial intelligence, machine learning, and innovative approaches. She received the David Sarnoff Research Center Technical Achievement Award, the Igal Alon uh, Fellowship for Outstanding, for Outstanding Young Scientists, the Morth Elevenson Prize in Mathematics, the Maria Petru Prize awarded by the IAPR for Outstanding Contribution to the Field of Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition, the Landau Prize in Artificial Intelligence, the Rothschild Prize in Mathematics and Computer uh, Science. She received the ECCV Best Paper Award twice and was awarded the honorable mention for the Mar Prize twice. In, um, in 2017, Michal received the Helmholtz Prize, Prize, the Test of Time Award for the paper Actions as Space Time Shapes. She has more than 30,000 citations, published almost 100 papers, which many um, many of which are highly influential. She supervised and is supervising many, many graduate students, many of which have continued to the industry and or have continued to a successful scientific career. So without further ado, we're very excited to have you with us today, Michal, to hear about your research, actually one of the first computer vision lectures in our series. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay. So actually, uh, by the way, Sean, where did you take this from? It's not from me. <laughs> Sorry, where do I take what? The bio. It's, I, I didn't send you that. <laughs> you sent me that. That's the basis. And then I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope I got nothing wrong. No, no, you got so much into it. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I actually uh, have two parts to my talk. In the first part, uh, wait a second, oops. In the first part, I'd like to tell you about something we've been working in my lab in the last few years, what I call deep internal learning. That is to say how we can train a deep network in a totally unsupervised way without ever having seen any prior examples by training on a single image, the test image along the image on which we want to perform the inference. And uh, as you'll see, uh, uh, and uh, why, why are we interested in doing this? Well, we're all used to what they call external learning. That is to say, we train a deep network and lots and lots of data externally provided to us. Uh, we train it for hours, days, sometimes even weeks, and then we freeze the network and apply it to new test data as it comes along. And this does amazingly well as long as you have enough training data. But what happens if you don't have enough training data? What happens if your test data is outside the distribution of your training data? In those cases, deep learning does miserably. And what I'd like to show you is how we can often resolve these problems by replacing external learning with internal learning by training on a single image. And as you'll see, uh, this gives rise to a variety of applications, including spatial super resolution and images, uh, temporal super resolution and video, image dehazing, segmentation, transparency separation, image retargeting, and more. Now, I won't be able to show you all these things, so I, uh, sub I picked a subset of these, but uh, if you'd like, after the talk, I can show you more stuff. So this is the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I'd like to tell you about a different branch of work in my lab, what I call mind reading, how we can decode brain activity, and in particular, how we can recover visual information seen by a person directly from his or her fMRI and brain activity. And as you'll see here, we can also do this when we have only little uh, training data, uh, also by exploiting some self-supervision. And now the first part of my talk, uh, the main person behind this is uh, my former PhD student, Asaf Shukhil, who graduated a few months ago and is now doing his postdoc at Berkeley. And uh, the second part, the main person behind it is, again, my former PhD student, Guy Gaziv, who's just still around and is leaving for a postdoc at MIT uh, in a few months. 
Uh, so let's start. How can we train a deep network on a single image? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of redundancy inside a single natural image, both in the uh, input scale as well as across different scales of the image. When I say within scale, I mean that if you see a small patch once inside the image, you'll almost surely see it many more times inside the same image. Now here I'm showing you relatively large patches for visual purposes, but in practice, I'm talking about much smaller patches, five pixels by five pixels or seven by seven. And this property has been used by us and many others for a wide variety of applications over the past two decades, including image denoising, completion of missing information, visual summarization, and more. Uh, what do I mean by it? Uh, repetition of the cross scales? Well, if you take this input image and you scale it down, then almost any patch in the original input scale will appear as is without scaling down the patch in coarser scales of the image, which means that tiny patterns appear in multiple sizes in the original image. Now, again, I'm showing you large patches. I'm talking about much smaller patches. Uh, and this too has been used by us and by others for a variety of applications, including fractal image compression, super resolution from a single image, image deblurring, dehazing, and more. Now, this may look like a very contrived image to you, and you can ask, well, does this go beyond images with such clear repetitive structure? And the answer is yes. If you go to small patches, five by five, seven by seven, this is true for almost any patch in almost any natural image. For example, if I show you this image, which doesn't have such clear repetitive structure, then if you look at these edge patches, they appear many, many more times along the same edge. Or if I scale down uh, this image, edge patches will appear as is across scales. And similarly for corner patches. So you can say, okay, repetitive structure, corner edges. What happens if I go to untextured images like this? Well, let's zoom into this image. And you can see that locally you have the same uh, uh, textures, the same structures and so on. And it turns out that this fractal-like property is a very, very strong property of natural images. And we verified this empirically in our 2009 paper. So as I said, this gave rise to lots of applications over the past two decades. And just to give you an idea how strong this prior is, let me show you an example of a work of ours from 17 years ago, how we use this to complete visual information. Um, let's say you have this input image. You want to guess what's behind this bungee player. You can probably make an intelligent guess. Well, what we want to do is build a, uh, a computer algorithm that does that. And the way we, we did this was we said that the most likely completion of the missing information is the one that will maximize this repetition of patches in multiple scales of the image. And this can be posed as a well-defined objective function and solved with a greedy EM-like algorithm. But if you do that, that was the kind of result that we got. Not perfect, it's a greedy algorithm, but it's not bad. That's the uh, result when, you, when we try to maximize the repetition of patches inside uh, the image. And uh, those of you who are familiar with content-aware fill of Adobe Photoshop, it's actually based on our algorithm. In fact, uh, Weizmann licensed the patent to Adobe. Um, you can also do this uh, for video uh, data. If I ask you what's behind this umbrella, you can probably make an intelligent guess again. Uh, we can ask the algorithm to complete it. And here we maximize the recurrence of small space-time patches and multiple spatial temporal scales of the video. And when we do that, this is the result that you get. You can see it automatically completed the heads of people, the waves in the water. Of course, the algorithm knows nothing about people, water, walking. There's no semantic understanding here. This is just the most likely uh, uh, completion of space-time patches given the space-time patches and the remaining parts of the video. So this was just to give you an idea of how powerful this uh, internal repetition of patches is. And as I said, it gave rise to lots of uh, applications over the, over the years. The nice thing about it, it's totally unsupervised. It doesn't require any additional examples other than the information that is already contained in the input image or video. The bad news is that in the last few years, these methods have been overcome by deep learning methods, which you know is quite depressing. So uh, for a while, I was actually depressed about this. And, uh, but then I said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. But then on one hand, we have this very, very powerful tool, deep learning, which does amazingly well, but is really data hungry. It requires tons of data, and we don't really understand what it learns. And on the other hand, we have this strong internal redundancy prior, which we understand doesn't require any additional examples. All the information is already there in your single image, but doesn't perform as well. And, we, and I was asking, is there a way to combine the power of these two complementary uh, approaches? 
And luckily, uh, four years ago, uh, my student, Asaf Shukher, came up with a brilliant idea of doing deep internal learning. That is to say, let's train an image-specific CNN. CNN is a convolutional neural network. It's a type of a neural network. Let's train an image-specific CNN at test time on examples extracted directly from the test image alone. And as you'll see shortly, this can be done actually quite efficiently. So the first problem we looked at was that of super resolution, how we can use deep internal learning to super resolve an image. Now, in the resolution of an image is determined by the density of the pixels inside the image. You can see fine details that are larger than a pixel size. Of course, you cannot see details that are smaller than a pixel size. And in super resolution, we want to increase the pixel density, but we don't want to just interpolate, which is what you see here. Interpolation only stretches the information. We want to be able to recover information that is smaller than a pixel size. We want to go beyond the Nyquist limit of this image. And uh, I won't review all the literature on super resolution, but by far the current leading methods are deep learning based methods or what I call external uh, deep learning methods. And their idea is the following, let's train uh, as a CNN on lots and lots of pairs of low resolution, high resolution images. We'll train the network so that it gets as an input, a low resolution input and learns to spit out the high resolution a output. Now we can train it on lots and lots of such examples because all we have to do is take high quality images, scale them down and we have lots of such pairs of examples. So such a network can be trained for days on lots of pairs of high resolution, low resolution images. And then once trained, the network is fixed and applied to new low resolution images it never saw before, and out comes the high resolution uh, output. And this does amazingly well. In fact, it gave about 2 dB improvement in PSNR over anything that existed prior to deep learning. However, when Asaf and I checked it, we found out that this works well only under ideal conditions. And when I say ideal conditions, I mean, after all, the low resolution images were generated from the high resolution ones by scaling them down. They were synthesized by some assumed known degradation. But you know, the world is not ideal. Low resolution images are never the same as the one you simulate in those cases. And when I take a picture, I slightly move my camera and it's a one type of downscaling kernel. And the next picture I'll take, I move my hand slightly differently and uh, it'll be a different uh, degradation. And each, uh, pixel, each picture has its own degradation. And those networks work amazingly well as long as they are applied to images which are downscaled in this synthetic way. But once taken out of their comfort zone to real data, they don't perform any better than simple interpolation as I'll, sh I'll show you shortly. So we said, well, let's solve this problem by replacing external learning with internal learning. Let's adapt the network to the image specific degradation. We call it zero shot super resolution or ZSSR in short. And the idea is the following. Here is your low resolution input image. You never saw anything before in your life. That's the only image you ever saw. What we're going to do is the counterintuitive thing. We're going to downscale this image even further to generate an even lower resolution image. And now we're going to train a light image specific CNN to learn to super resolve this particular image. And all it has to do is to recover back the original input, low resolution input image. Once trained on this image, it can now be applied to the original input image to generate the super resolved high resolution output. And the rationale here is the following. Because we have the strong recurrence of patches across scales of the input image, whatever network is good for increasing the resolution of patches in this tiny image will also be good for increasing the resolution of the patches in the original image. Or in other words, a network that is good for increasing the resolution of the small image from half the resolution to one, will also be good for increasing the resolution of the image from one to two, okay, by a factor of two. Now, uh, of course, training a network on a single input output pair is a little bit stretching it. So we're going to generate lots and lots of, of, of pairs of high resolution, uh, low resolution, high resolution pairs by augmenting the input image. We're going to flip it, rotate it, scale it, will generate hundreds of such pairs of low resolution, high resolution images. And this will, uh, all with the same patch statistics, and this will generate an image specific CNN. Now, because this network, all it has to learn is to increase the resolution of the patches in this particular image, it's a very light network. And therefore it can be trained very fast, nine seconds on a single GPU training plus test time. 
Now, what about the downscaling? We said every image has its own degradation. We have, of course, to degrade it correctly in order to be able to later apply it to the original input image. Well, it turns out that we can recover the degradation which was used to generate this image also directly from the input image. In fact, the correct degradation is the one that if you apply it to the high resolution image will maximize the similarity of patches across scales. And uh, we have a proof of that, an analytic proof of that claim in our 2013 uh, paper uh, together with Tomer Micheli, uh, where we proved it and also developed the classical algorithm for that. And more recently in 2019, we developed a deep internal learning based algorithm, which computes the degradation of the image directly from the input image itself. But I have no time to go into this. Uh, nevertheless, this generates super resolution in the wild. It can be applied to any data type. External images, if you train them on natural images, they will learn how to super resolve natural images. They will not know what to do with medical images. Here we adapt the network to the image specific data and the image specific degradation. It can be applied to any data type, any kernel type, any degradation, any scale and aspect ratio. So let's look at results. Here is a low resolution image with, which, which was downscaled with an unknown uh, downscaling uh, kernel. Uh, if you apply just plain interpolation to this, this is what it would look like, which is of course blurry. If you apply externally trained uh, super resolution uh, algorithm, one of the uh, state of the art, this is what you get. And there's nothing wrong with your eyesight. If I'll flicker between the two, you'll barely be able to say to tell the difference because there is no difference. Now, it's not that this EDSR, this externally trained super resolution is not good. It's wonderful, but it's wonderful on images downscaled ideally in the way they, uh, the data set they trained on. But once taken out of this comfort zone, like this image, it doesn't perform any better than interpolation. In contrast, here is the result of the internally trained super resolution. And if I'll flicker between the external and internal, you can see the dramatic difference. And the reason internal learning does so well here is because it adapts the network to the image specific degradation and the image specific recurrence of patches. Here's another example, an image we downloaded from the internet, an old photo post-World War II Checkpoint Charlie before the wall was uh, built. We have no idea how it was generated. This is simple interpolation. Uh, this is externally trained super resolution. And once again, if I'll flicker between the two, you'll be, er you'll be barely able to tell the difference because this is not an ideal image on which it was trained. It's outside the distribution of its training data. And here is the internally trained uh, super resolution. And if I'll flicker between the two, you'll be able to see the dramatic difference. Can you see my mouse, by the way? Can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can see yeah. Okay. Yeah. So look at, look at the legs over here. You can see that uh, we're actually able to uh, generate information, recover information that is smaller than a pixel size. Okay, we can go beyond the Nyquist limit, again, because we adapt the network to the image specific downscaling kernel and the image specific recurrence of patches, or look at the back of the motorbikes here, and so on. And uh, again, here is a JPEG compressed image. It's okay when it's small. If you super resolve it using external methods, they don't know they, they super resolve both signal and the JPEG noise because they don't know otherwise. Uh, they weren't trained to do otherwise. Uh, and and, and uh, here is the result of the internally trained one. And if I'll flicker between the two, you can see that we super resolve the signal, but we eliminate the noise. How come? We didn't train uh, on this noise either. We don't we know nothing about the noise, but the nice thing is that the patches of the signal recur across scale of a natural image recur across scale where noise patches do not have this nice repetition across scales. So the network, which is internally trained on lots of internal examples, knows how to generalize for the signal, but it doesn't know what to do with the noise. And of course we have empirical evaluations. Uh, we tested both on ideally downscaled images we do reasonably well, but of course, the externally trained methods do much better. That's the bread and butter. That's what they were trained to do. But once taken out of their comfort zone to non-ideal images with uh, non-ideal downscaling kernels or unknown noise and so on, we do one or two dB better than the externally trained state-of-the-art methods, at least at the time of the publication of this paper. Okay, so so far I showed you how we can do super resolution with an image-specific uh, uh, CNN. Uh, the nice thing about it, it's totally unsupervised. It requires nothing but the input image. 
it adapts, adapts itself to the unknown image specific degradation. And as I said, at least at the time of the publication, it gave state of the art results on real non ideal images. Uh, but then we asked ourselves, well, can we take this idea of deep internal learning to other domains? Can we use it uh, to perform image segmentation, segment an image into its foreground and background layers, take an image which was taken under a day with a fog and generate a dehazed image as if taken on, under a day with good weather conditions, uh, take an image where we have transparent, superimposed transparent layers and separate it into its uh, uh, individual layers, into its reflection and transmission. And the answer is yes, we can do all of these by training on the single input image and moreover, all of these seemingly different problems can be posed as the same problem and solved in a single unified framework of layer decomposition. What do I mean by that? Well, each one of those images can actually be thought of as a linear combination of two other images, two other image layers, layers here is not layers in network, but image layers, where the only difference is the way they're linearly combined. In the case of image segmentation, these are the foreground and background layers combined with a binary segmentation mask. In the case of transparency separation, these are the two transparent layers combined with a constant coefficient. And in the case of image dehazing, these are the haze-free image and the fog air light combined with what's known as the transmission map, which is inversely proportional to the depth uh, in the scene. But so you see that all of these are actually linear combinations of two different uh, images with uh, the only difference is the kind of mask that combines them. And we solve all of these with a single unified framework, which we call double dip. Uh, and I'll explain uh, how it works and why we call it double dip. So our uh, framework is based on what we uh, on, on a work by Ulya Novet Al, which came out at the same conference as our uh, ZSSR, Zero Shot Super Resolution. And their uh, method is called deep image prior. And their idea is the following. Given a single input image, you'd like to train a network CNN that will learn, will get as input just random noise, the same random noise throughout the iterations, but will learn to recover this particular image. Okay. Now, of course, if all the network has to learn is to output this particular image, eventually it will overfit this image. But when it does so, the weights that it learns in the network form a deep image prior on this particular uh, image. Why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that if you give it a noisy image, then yes, eventually it will overfit this noisy image. But it turns out that in, in some intermediate inter iteration along the way, it generates a clean version of this image. And Ulyanov et al. used this for solving a variety of ill-posed inversion problems. But this is very intriguing. Why is it easier for the network to recover the clean image than to recover the noisy image? And, the, and our exploration of this, we, we said that the reason this happens is because the patch entropy in the clean image is a low one, whereas in the noisy image, it's a high one. Remember, we said that every patch, if you see it once inside the image, you'll see it many more times inside the same image. So it means that the distribution of patches inside a single image is actually quite simple. But those two patches that were identical in the clean image are no longer identical in the noisy image. Each one of them is superimposed with a different noise. And so the deep image prior being a fully convolutional network, it's easier for it to spit the same type of uh, patches in different uh, parts of the image. And therefore it's easier for the deep image prior to learn an image, to converge onto an image with a simple distribution of patches than an image with a complex distribution of patches. And in our paper, we empirically verify this assumption and show that this is correct, but I'll skip the empirical evaluation. So armed with this observation, we said, well, let's use a pair of deep image prior, double dip, in order to decompose an image into its two layers. So for example, if you take a mixed image like this, what we will do is we will train two different deep image priors such that their sum will give us the mixed image. Now again, since all this network has to learn to output this particular mixed image, eventually it will overfit it. But here's where the magic uh, happens. It turns out that it's the easiest thing is for, this, for these two networks to split the patches among themselves. Each deep image prior prefers to spit out a simple distribution of patches and not a complex one of mixed patches. So they'll prefer if, if a part of the horse appears only already once inside, uh, patches of the horse appear once inside the, the left image, 
all other patches of the horse will prefer to appear in the left image and similarly for the other layer in the right image. And in order to further encourage them to be decomposed into those two uh, uh, networks, we add an exclusion loss which penalizes for correlation across patch of, of patches across those two layers. And this generates our two recovered layers. Now, in this case, it was a simple addition because all we had is a transparency separation. We saw that in some of the tasks, the mask is much more complicated. It's some complicated masks times layer one plus one minus the, the complicated mask times layer two. So we add a third network, a third deep image par, which learns the mask. And the only difference between the three tasks I mentioned before is the kind of loss we put on the mask, the kind of penalty we put on the generated mask. So for example, in the case of transparency uh, separation, we encourage the mask to be uniform, constant. In the case of image segmentation, we encourage the mask to be binary and penalize it for something that gets farther away from a binary uh, mask. And so, for example, for this particular image, yes, eventually it overfits this image, but when it splits the patches across those two deep image priors, uh, first of all, this is the mask that it learned, and these are the two uh, layers that it learned. And you can see that one deep image prior learned to spit out zebra patches, whereas the other one learned to spit out uh, grass patches. So uh, this kind of uh, idea of training a double a pair of deep image priors on a single image can be used for a wide variety of applications. So we used it for image segmentation. We showed you one example, but here are other examples. So here are input images. We train the network on each input image individually, and here is the resulting segmentation mask it recovered. Now, this is not semantic segmentation. The network never saw any other images, never doesn't know anything about semantic understanding. Of course, semantic segmentation, where you give pairs of images and their uh, a, uh, semantic uh, segmentation, and you train it on millions of such examples, it'll do better than what we do. Nevertheless, this network has seen nothing, be uh, and, and, and nothing before and is still able to do things that are far from being trivial. It's able to put those two old ladies in a single layer together with their carts and the background in a different layer. It puts those three soldiers in a single layer and the rest in the other layer. It separates this image into two different textures simply because this is a simplest decomposition it can perform into two simpler distribution of patches. Uh, we can apply it to image dehazing. So here are real images taken under a fog. Remember, in the case of fog, the two layers are the haze-free image, the fog air light, and the mask, the recovered mask will be the transmission map. So here in those cases are the haze-free image recovered from those images. And here is the transmission map, the mixing map mask that was recovered. And you can, and bright is nearby, dark is far away. And you can see that we can recover the depth from a single hazy image by using this, by training on a single input uh, image. Uh, here is another example, transparency separation. This is a real video of, a, of, some, of a, an outdoor scene being reflected in a revolving door. And you can see that inside the building, there is some golden statue. You can see the camera on the tripod looking at the revolving door. Uh, you can see it moving as the door is revolving. Uh, here's the separation into the two different layers. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um, and uh, of course, things like watermark removal, which is another type of decomposition into two different layers and so on. And I want to remind you in all these cases, it was done in a totally unsupervised way with no prior example. The network was trained on the single input uh, image or input video. So, um, and by, and so, so far I showed you this more or less concludes my first part, how we can train uh, an, a deep network uh, on a, a, a generate an image specific CNN with what, what, what I call internal learning, how we can train a deep network in a totally unsupervised way by combining the power of deep learning with internal image specific priors. The nice thing about it, it's totally unsupervised. It requires nothing but the input image and uh, it can be applied to a variety of applications. I showed you how we can use it for spatial super resolution, but we can also use it for temporal super resolution of video, taking a 25 frame video and recovering from it without ever having seen any prior example, a 200 frame per second video where we can recover dynamic events that occur faster than frame rate, okay? How we can use this for image dehazing, 
image segmentation, transparency separation. We can also use this for image retargeting, generating visual summaries of images by exploiting the redundancy. I uh, Unfortunately, I have no time. All of these things I pushed after the conclusion. So if you want to ask me things later on, I can show some of these things later on. Uh, and I'd like to move on to the second part, unless you want to ask questions now uh, or you want to defer them to the end of the talk, either is fine. Um, you know what, maybe should I go on and just at the end of the talk, I'll answer whatever. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it's best that you go on and then if people have questions, we yeah can be left to the end. Okay. So uh, I'd like to move on to the second part, uh, what I call mind reading, how we can decode visual information from fMRI brain recordings. Uh, this is based on uh, work with Guy Gaziv, Roman Bailey, uh, Niv Granot, Asaf Kugi, and Francesca Stolpini and Tal Golan. As I said, the main leading person behind this is Guy Gaziv. Uh, we have a paper published in Europe's uh, 2019 and two other papers under, currently under review. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to show you next. Um, so the idea is the following. You have a person lying in an fMRI machine uh, watching images. The fMRI, uh, the brain activity is being recorded. And we look at the area of the visual cortex. And the question is, can you recover from those brain recordings the image that the person saw, synthesize it, and also be able to classify it, say what the person saw, whether it's a tiger, or whether it's a, uh, an elephant, a fish, or whatever. Uh, why is this interesting? Well, it can be used for uh, brain machine interfaces. It can be used to communicate maybe with locked in patients, uh, people who are uh, uh, cannot communicate but understand everything, but completely conscious. Um, explore dreams, study consciousness, and so on. We're nowhere there, but I'd like to show you our first baby steps uh, in, these, in this area. Uh, and the idea, of course, of being able to decode visual uh, and, and brain recordings to uh, uh, visual information is not new. Uh, it's been explored by more than a decade by very famous uh, computational neuroscientists, including uh, Galland, Kay, Nasselaris, Kamitani, and more. And their idea is let's take uh, pairs of images and their recorded fMRI, and let's try uh, to find a way to decode these fMRIs into images. Of course, we'd like to be able for this to apply to fMRIs of new images that we don't have in our training data. Now, um, originally a decade ago, like the famous work by Gallant and so on, uh, was done using linear regression methods they, between uh, handcrafted feature, uh, handcrafted fMRI and the image features. In the past few years, deep learning methods have come into play. Uh, the problem is that there's not enough training data. As I said, deep learning methods require tons of training data, but typically those data sets, and I don't collect fMRI data, we use, uh, use existing data sets. These data sets contain maybe a thousand pairs of images and their corresponding fMRIs, 1,200 uh, pairs. But uh, this is not enough visual information to cover the huge space of natural images. Also, it's different from brain to brain, and there's a limited time of how much you can put a person in an fMRI machine that causes this limitation, but also it's not like you can let one person watch those 1,000 images and another person watch another 1,000 images. It differs from brain to brain, okay? And the signal to noise ratio, I don't have to tell you guys, is very, very poor. And that forms a glass ceiling of what can be done with these kind of data. And so we said, well, let's try to break this limit by uh, handle the lack of data with cell supervision, a different type of cell supervision than what I showed you in the first part, but let's see. So the idea is we train two different networks. One is a network that learns to decode fMRI into images. We call it a decoder. That's eventually the network we want to use in order to decode fMRI of new, never before seen images. But when only trained in a supervised way on those 1,200 pairs, that's not enough. It will overfit those 1,200 images, do amazingly well on them, but will not be able to generalize into uh, fMRI of new images. Uh, we also train another network in the other way, in the, the opposite direction, what we call an encoder. We'd like to encode images back into fMRI. We call this an, a network and encoder. And this too, again, when trained only on those 1,000 pairs of images in fMRI, will not be, do amazingly well. But here is where the trick comes in. We handle the lack of training data by adding self-supervision. And the way we do this is the following. Take any image, a natural image, without any fMRI. 
what we'll do is we'll apply to it the encoder. This will probably generate some garbage fMRI, okay? And if we apply to this garbage fMRI the decoder, this will probably generate some garbage image. Uh, you know, the encoder never saw this image, the decoder never saw this fMRI, they're not, that's outside their distribution. However, since we went back and forth, we know that the output of this combined network has to be the same as the input image. And by imposing this on the output, we can improve the network weights, especially those of the decoder. And this cycle consistency can be done with any, with any image without fMRI, which means we can train it on as many images as we want. In fact, we train it on 50,000 ImageNet images. And this allows us to adapt the statistics of our decoder to, natural, to the statistics of natural images that it never saw in, the, in those pairs of uh, uh, fMRI images. But we can do more than that. We don't have to just impose a pixel level similarity. We can impose perceptual similarity in this cycle consistency in order to encourage it to, to develop semantically meaningful images. How do we do that? Well, we feed the input and the output into a pre-trained uh, image recognition uh, uh, network. These image classification networks like a pre-trained VG or AlexNet, these networks were trained in the computer vision community on millions of images with thousands of classes, okay? They were trained to do object recognition. As they were done to do, as they did so, the uh, features in the intermediate layers of the network were, were learned to, to generate semantically meaningful features, unlike handcrafted features. So what we do is we not only impose pixel level similarity between the output and input and the cycle consistency, but we also impose similarity of corresponding deep features between uh, those two uh, pre-trained networks. When you feed the input into such a pre-trained network and the output in such a pre-trained network, you expect to get similar uh, uh, readings, okay? We don't impose the labels at the end because the labels of the new images seen in the fMRI are not necessarily part of those image net uh, labels, okay? But corresponding features are semantically, mean, uh, intermediate features are semantically meaningful. And this allows us to adapt our decoder, not only to never before seen images, but also to never before seen classes, classes that were never seen inside the fMRI. But we can do even better than that. We can switch the order of those two networks. Now the input is an fMRI and the output of this cycle consistency should be the same fMRI, okay? Which means we can impose this on fMRI for which we don't have images. And in particular, we can impose this on the test fMRI that we wish to decode, okay? And this allows us to adapt our decoder, not only to the statistics, uh, 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 to um, uh, never before seen images, but also to new fMRI that are outside the distribution of the fMRI that we saw in the training data. And exploiting all these losses together in our uh, training, we can uh, uh, generate quite good looking results. So let's, look. of course, there are many more uh, details, but I'm skipping those in the interest of time. So let's look at results. Here is an image shown to a person in an fMRI, and here is the result rec reconstructed from the fMRI recordings uh, of this person from 4,500 voxels in the visual cortex. Uh, here is a, uh, so that was a goldfish, here is a whale, uh, here is an airplane, uh, uh, snowmobile, of course, none of these were in the training data. Uh, here is an outdoor scene, a llama, a beer glass, uh, tambourines, uh, and you can see many other uh, examples. Not all of them look, uh, not all of them are understandable. In some cases, the shape is recovered correctly, but not the color. Uh, and in some cases, the reconstructions are horrible. Here I showed you at the top, nice reconstructions. At the bottom, I'm showing you our worst reconstructions in the test data. So you can see that there's still a lot, of play, there's place for improvement. Nevertheless, these results, as far as we could check, are state-of-the-art image reconstruction results. And we evaluated it both by human raters with Amazon Mechanical Turk as well as by objective measures. And we compared it to, all, to the leading methods. Uh, and just to show you comparison to two leading methods, uh, here are on the left is, uh, here is a comparison to a work by Shenet Al from Kamitani's group. On the left column is the ground truth image that the person saw. On the middle, in the middle column is our reconstruction. 
and the right column is the reconstruction by uh, Kamitani's group. Uh, their method is a GAN-based method. So if you don't know what a GAN is, it's a generative adversarial network. It's a network that on one hand generates the images, but there's also a discriminator that has to say whether this image looks real or fake. And so that, that gives an improvement uh, to the images. And indeed, their images look visually very pleasing, much better, much more pleasing than ours. They look much more natural, okay? However, they're unfaithful to the, un, uh, to the underlying fMRI. For example, this teddy bear looks beautiful, but it's got nothing to do with the llama, which is the fMRI of the underlying image. Or uh, this doesn't look like a butterfly. It's, it's a pretty picture, but it's not a butterfly, okay? Uh, Um, there was a large data set, uh, and it, it was a black and white data set. By the way, the network was applied the same way with the same hyperparameters. Uh, and uh, again, the ground truth is on the left, our reconstructions in the middle, and their reconstructions on the right. There's this also a GAN based method. And uh, we compared uh, to both uh, methods on their own benchmarks. As far as we know, we're the only method that, can, that was applied to multiple benchmarks. And uh, we have state of the art results. Uh, but so far, I showed you how uh, given an image we can reconstruct from the fMRI uh, the image but if I were to just show you the image reconstruction I'm not sure that you would be able to say what's in this image okay it's not easy and so we wanted the uh, also to be able to decode those images also give a label say whether this is a fish or a fly or whatever in order to aid the person to understand what we see in those fMRIs uh, but this is a very challenging task for several reasons first of all the labels in the test data, okay, the test data that we have in the, we had in this data set, it has 50 test labels. None of them are including included in the 150 labels of the paired images in fMRI. They're new test uh, classes, classes that were not there uh, in the original uh, trained uh, in the original pairs in the training data. But worse, we cannot use a pre-trained image classification network and just apply it to our reconstructed images for two reasons. One, 30 out of the 50 Test labels are not even in the, are not part of the labels of those uh, uh, pre-trained networks that were trained on ImageNet. Okay, so we they they have never seen those labels, so it won't help us. Moreover, even if they did see those labels, look at those recovered images. They look very very different from natural images, so they're outside the distribution of those pre-trained networks, and therefore these networks don't know what to say about those images. Yet we set ourselves the goal to classify our reconstructed images against 1,030 ImageNet classes. And the reason it's 1,030 is because ImageNet has 1,000 classes and we added 30 missing ones. Okay, so now all the 50 test labels are included in the 1,030 class labels. We're not familiar with any uh, method that tried to do such a wide, uh, such a large scale uh, classification from brain activity. Uh, usually people do the two-way classification, a four-way classification, an eight-way classification. We try to do a 1,030-way classification. How do we do that? We cannot pre, uh, feed it into a pre-trained network, but what we do is the following. Here's our test fMRI, and when we decode it, we get this reconstructed image. What we do is we feed this image into a pre-trained classification network, for example, an AlexNet or whatever, and we took the fourth layer the deep features in the, in the fourth layer of this network when we fed the image. And this forms a signature that we associate with this reconstructed image, some intermediate layer and in the pre-trained uh, classification network. And now we match this, we look for the nearest neighbor of this uh, feature vector in a gallery of 1,030 class representatives, one representative per class. How do we generate those class representatives? Well, we generate them by, we randomly sample a hundred images from each class. For example, here are a few, uh, here are images sampled from the tiger shark class in ImageNet. We feed each one of those images into a pre-trained classification network and obtain its uh, own image signature. And then we average those 100 image signatures to generate our class representative. And this forms one class representative in our gallery. And we do it for all 1,030 classes. We randomly sample 100 images per class, compute their class, rep uh, compute their image representatives, average them, this is our class representative. And it turns out that this kind of search for, for nearest neighbor class representative, we apply it to 
to the uh, to the now the fifty uh, test labels are new. They're not part, as I said, they're not part of the one hundred fifty class labels that we had in the one thousand two hundred training pairs, nor are they part of the fifty thousand external images that we used, as I said, to for the cycle consistency. We made sure that the new uh, fifty classes are not part of them. Yet, we're able to obtain using this method. 12% top one accuracy in a 1030 weight classification. That is to say that in 12% of the test uh, uh, fMRIs, the uh, class that was ranked number one was the correct class out of 1030, okay? So let's look at this visually. Here, for example, are uh, on the left are the ground truth uh, images, okay? With their ground truth labels, okay, in the test data. Here are uh, the images we reconstructed from the fMRI. And let me show you now the top five ranked classes out of 1,030 for each one of those images. So here you see, for example, if we look at the first row, uh, what's, by the way, the red boundary means this is the correct class. So you can see that in this, for this image, it correctly classified it as a house fly in the first place. But you can see that also other things in this image make sense. For example, a cicada or a fly, by the way, it turns out that fly and house fly are different classes. Or the second image, it correctly ranked airliner as the number one class out of 1,030, but you can see that in the second place, it found a warplane and it found other vessels in the, uh, in the other places. Or the stained glass window was ranked number one the, the first class, but you can see that found the vending machine as the second place, a slot machine, an altar. All these were the classes that were ranked top five. Or the beer mug was ranked one, but you can see that the coffee mug was ranked, ranked number three. Here we had a mistake. The correct class label is swan, and our reconstructed image, which if you look at it, you can't tell that it's a swan or anything like that, was classified as a duck, okay, which is incorrect. But you can see that in the fourth place, it found the correct class. Okay. So as I said, in 12% of the cases in the test data, we rank, the correct class was ranked number one out of 1,030 way classification. But even when it got it wrong and the correct class was not in the top five, uh, we still have results that make a lot of sense. Our errors make a lot of sense. For example, look at this llama. It wasn't ranked here in any of the top five, but you can see that it ranked classes of furry white uh, animals, or leopard was not ranked in the top five, but it found lion in the fifth place, or camel doesn't appear here, but Arabian camel was found in the second class. Apparently, Arabian camel and camel are two different classes. And canoe, it found a paddle boat in the fourth place. Goldfish, it didn't find goldfish in the top five, but it found some other under uh, underwater animal creatures. Uh, and my last slide in this uh, direction, we looked at the effect of different brain regions on our uh, reconstructions, how we're able to handle these. Uh, again, this is the ground truth images, and here is the reconstructions using all the 4,500 voxels we had from the full visual cortex. Uh, it turns out, of course, that as expected, the decoding quality is dominated by the early visual cortex, V1. Um, here, what you see is what happens if we use only the voxels from V1. Uh, the reconstruction is not as good as the full visual cortex, but you can see that most of the information is already recovered. If we add also V2 and V3, you can see that the results are slightly improved. For example, look at the handle of the beer glass here, or the um, uh, wings of the, the legs of the fly and so on. Uh, but, and if we only apply the high visual cortex voxels and remove completely the low visual cortex, these are re the reconstructions you get. Uh, you see more shapes, more colors, but it's not, uh, of course, it's not as good. Combining all of them together, uh, of course, gives us the best results. Okay, so let me summarize. I hope I've been able to convince you that there's a lot of redundancy inside a single natural image in the first part and that we can exploit this for generating image-specific networks. Uh, as I said, it combines the power of deep learning with internal image-specific priors. Uh, it's totally unsupervised, requires nothing but the input images. It adapts itself to the unknown imaging conditions and degradations and can be applied to a wide range of applications, including super resolution, image dehazing, segmentation, transparency separation, retargeting, and more. And 
there are lots of people involved in our work, but the things that I showed you, there are two people behind it, Asaf Shocher and Yossi Gandersman. Uh, in the second part, I show you how we can decode visual information from fMRI brain activity. Uh, the nice thing about it is we have limited amount of supervised data and we extend it uh, to self-supervision and re of, uh, of reconstruction and classification uh, on images without fMRI and on fMRI without images. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first ever large scale classification, as I said, 1,030 way from brain activity. And uh, we also have a new work that is currently under review, how we can use this for 3D depth reconstruction from fMRI. Instead of recovering RGB from fMRI voxels, we cover RGBD, uh, including the depth. Uh, I didn't show it here. Uh, and the people behind what I did show are Guy Gaziv, Roman Bailey, Niv Granot, Asaf Hubi, Francesca Stoppini, and Tal Gulan. What's next? Well, can we combine the power of internal and external learning? I mean, external learning only exploits external data. What I showed you only trains from scratch on each new images. Can we somehow bridge the two extremes? Can we generate a continuum between external and internal learning? These are things that we're looking at. Nothing interesting to report yet. Uh, can we apply it to other types of signals or domains? Can we apply it to audio, medical imagery, EEG? I don't know. Uh, fMRI, can we combine information from multiple brains? Exploit, as I said, each brain will see different types of images, but we can combine the power of all of them. After all, they do have shared information. It's not totally from scratch. Can we uh, use the uh, uh, all of the, these together to improve our reconstructions. Can we apply it to video data and not only still imagery? Can we recover dreams? I don't know. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Michal. It was a wonderful and inspiring talk, fascinating. And I want to invite everybody to unmute yourself. And first, let's give Michal a big applause for a wonderful, uh, exciting talk. And there are already a few questions in the chat. So we can start by having questions, um, or I can, um, I can read from the chat. So uh, Laura Fanda asks for later, does generating the test fMRIs pose any bias in the performance of the algorithm? Again, what was the question? Does generating? Does generating the test fMRIs cause any bias in the performance of the algorithm? We don't generate test fMRIs. Uh, what do you mean by, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm not on, the test fMRIs are given to us. They are, uh, Okay, I, I'm not sure I understood the question, but let me explain what 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 the data that we have is. Uh, there there were 1,200 images for which fMRI was collected, and those are our training data. In the taste data, uh, maybe that was the question. The statistics is different, and the signal to noise ratio is different in the sense that uh, uh, the same image was shown to the person 35 times each time the fMRI was collected. So in fact. We have 35 different fMRI readings per image in the test data, whereas in the training data, we have only one. So we can average them and get better signal-to-noise ratio, but then it's not the same distribution as the test data, as the training data. The way we do exploit it is in order to compute the signal-to-noise ratio per voxel. Uh, given a voxel, we have actually 35 different readings per, per image, but we also have for this voxel, 50 different uh, images on which it was uh, taken. And so we can say whether the variance across the different recordings of the same image and compare that variance to the variance of that voxel in different images. And that's how we compute the signal to noise ratio per voxel. And we give more weight to voxels with high signal to noise ratio. But I'm not sure that was the question. <laughs> yeah, I can try okay, to yeah. specify it a bit more. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I can try to talk about it a little bit more. I think sure. I might have misunderstood a part. By the way, the presentation was wonderful. Thank you very much. You. Um, it was in the part where you were taking the test fMRIs, um, applying the decoder, then the encoder, then oh, okay. that, in that part. I'm not sure if you, in the end, generated anything from that or if you used the par parameters of... Uh, no, we use this in order to improve our decoder, to, uh, re to fine tune our decoder and to adapt it to the test data. 
Okay, but there, there shouldn't be any bias. And I thought there was it was generating additional. Uh, no, 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 we're okay. not generating anything. We're just using this cycle consistency to improve our decoder. Okay, and while I have you here, I'll ask the second part of the of, for the second part another question. Do you mm -hmm. think that the uh, V1 to V3 uh, results where you tried to section, um, I think a couple of slides before, if, if you mind moving. Oh, sure. Do you think that the LVC, the V1 to V3 region, uh, is looking at more of the high frequency or high um, higher frequency details of the image? It, it, uh, they are. I mean, the, uh, okay, first of all, I can tell you for sure that the mm -hmm. signal to noise ratio of the lower visual cortex is significantly higher than the signal to noise ratio of the voxels from the higher visual cortex. So that's one good reason why we're getting more data out of, uh, and the highest signal to noise ratio is in V1. So that's one of the reasons why we're getting more data from V1. But also remember, we're trying to recover image information uh, and therefore it, it makes a lot of sense that V1 will give us most, most of the data. Those people, by the way, were told uh, to focus on the center of the image. There was a cross there, so they didn't move their eyes. So there's not supposed to be a lot of fluctuation uh, in V1. There, I, I think, I suspect there is a bit because people, you know, as, as much as we want to focus on the middle uh, uh, pixel, you know, our eyes move a little bit whether we want it or not. And so we did add a little bit of randomness uh, when we took an image, uh, compute the encoder. You have an image in an output fMRI, we randomly shifted by plus minus one pixel, assuming that the person is not that good at fixating. And, uh, uh, and that actually improved our encoder. But um, other than that, I think the V1 is just closest to the image and therefore it gives us the best uh, reconstructions. As you get farther and farther away from V1, uh, you get into, first of all, voxels with lower signal to noise ratio, but also more and more into semantic information. Thank you very much. It would be really cool to see how this works with uh, videos. Uh, uh, lovely, thank you. Uh, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> it's not as good yet. <laughs> I mean, don't forget that in video, uh, video data has 30 frames per second, whereas fMRI ha has uh, one fMRI every two seconds, yet we want in video to recover the temporal information. Of course, we have external videos that we use that supply us uh, a lot of prior yeah. data on natural videos, but uh, it's, much, it's a much more complicated. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Ra Rijul Sones uh, uh, says, thank you for the interesting talk. I have a query. In the fMRI reconstruction work, how did you identify the informative voxels for the reconstruction? Um, was an was an ROI sorry was an ROI selection perhaps of the visual cortex performed prior to training or did you auto encode or did the auto encoder network take the full brain voxels and try to minimize the loss function accordingly I mean I assume it's the first that you use an ROI uh, selection first of all as I said I'm not a neuroscientist we got the data. Uh, this is Kamitani's data, and they have labeling of which voxels are from which brain region and so on. We treat it as a, a, as a simple vector of 4,500 uh, 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 voxels. We don't use any prior knowledge of brain uh, regions and so on. Um, so we haven't exploited that. But when, when I show you the results only with V1, we just dropped all the other voxels and trained our network only using the V1 voxels. Uh, but we didn't exploit any kind of information on, on, on the brain uh, uh, regions of interests and so on. That would be, uh, would probably improve our results. We did, however, check that our uh, trained encoder and decoder actually uh, uh, provide visually, mini uh, actually uh, uh, generate semantic, uh, not semantic, uh, actually correspond to meaningful regions in the brain. Actually, after the fact, we checked where well, there's the uh, receptive field of a pixel in the image and, and where it is, it, which voxel it falls to. And it makes a lot of sense, okay, in terms of the eccentricity and so on. And, uh, uh, but we didn't em employ any such constraints. So, um, I, yeah, it sounds like that should um, answer the question. Merav has uh, two questions. Merav, do you want to ask them yourself or should I read them? I'll ask the first one. 
I'll, I'll skip the first one and only ask the, uh, about the, the second. Uh, thanks, Mikhail, it was great. Um, so obviously I'm interested in the reverse direction and this is what's the best decoding tell us about the brain. I mean, for example, suppose you have a red plane versus a blue plane. Can you tell anything about what is it in the brain that decodes the color or something like that? Can you tell, can you tell where in the brain, uh, which voxels in the brain were responsible for this reconstruction? Well, it doesn't need to be necessarily mapped to specific voxels. It could be mapped to some other relations between the patterns of activity. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of what, what is it that is the most informative aspect or the thing that changes for manipulations? We know what they mean. I mean, kind of either simple or complex and whether we can say anything about how these things are decoded in the uh, brain. To do that. What's most informative? What is the most informative decoding of color or whatever? I mean, of course it depends on what aspects of decoding we are looking at, but I'm thinking whether it could be a, 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 an insightful way of trying to decipher, of course, given the limitation of the methods, right? Because it says something about how it's best decoded given uh, voxel representations, but still, I think it could be very insightful. So I wonder what you think about it. So, so again, I'm trying to see, for, first of all, uh, 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 we have, as I said, we're, it's, we're just, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say that in English for a long time, but, but I'd love, I'd love, I mean, I'd love to work on these things. And if you'd like to collaborate, I'll be happy, but I'm, I'm, st I'm still, I, I'm trying to understand. You're saying, let's say I took an image of something red and I took an image of something blue. Of course, I don't have their MRIs because I don't, but you're saying if I take the decoder that I trained and go back from them, to uh, the voxels, what what the question? You, what has changed from this to that? Right. You can say is color represented. Let's say let's take other other kind of figures and have blue versus uh, red and see whether there's anything that consistently changes in the pattern of activation of the voxels that you have in the most reliable way in terms of information and whether it can tell us anything about just as an example about how color is coded here. We haven't done that. That's a great question. I don't have an answer, but it's a it's a it's a it's a great question. I mean, I think it's a potentially very exciting tool to be yeah. that word and I'm happy to take this together. I would be happy to chat on this offline. I, I, we haven't done anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Um okay, wonderful. Um Yaniv Morgenstern says uh thank you for the interesting talk. I mean, I see any of you are here, so if you want to I'll read it, but I, you're most welcome to ask it yourself. So the first question is um how well does internal learning abstract to novel untrained images? That's the first question. And then is there a difference between self-supervised versus unsupervised network or are they interchangeable um are they interchangeable terms? Okay, so let me answer the first one. Uh, internal learning is always on untrained images. It's always, uh, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, I, I, maybe I didn't understand. It seems like there was one picture uh, in the input and then it was, for, for example, for the resolution one, um, it was made smaller and then it somehow it was, it, it took nine seconds and you learned how to uh, enlarge it by minimizing it on the original image. Mm -hmm. And then I apply it to that particular image. If I want to apply it to a different image, I retrain it on that different image. I see. So uh, if you wanted to, uh, so there's no way you have, you, there's no way you could put a new image in after you yeah. trained it and look at how it would It does. Do. There is a way and you could yes. do it. We did that. It does, it, it doesn't, it, it it, it, there's a lot of commonality between images. So it does a lot of things that make sense, but it won't be as good as training it on that particular image for two reasons. One is there are patches that are unique to each one of the images, but the more important thing is each image has its own degradation. And uh, if you want to adapt it to, that's one of the, the things that I said, how can we exploit the power of internal learning and external learning? How can we combine the fact that we have multiple data yet be able to adapt it to each specific one? It's not just let's train on lots of things and then only fine tune on the specific image, that doesn't work. Uh, but 
obviously you don't want to train from scratch on each image uh, again. So, uh, but, but what I tell you here, you train from scratch on each new image. Th thank you, thank you. And uh, the second one, um... Uh, I'm just curious oh, about oh, oh, unsupervised oh, oh. and uh, supervised. Self-supervision. Uh, self-supervision, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah. I've heard the terms oh. before, but I'm uh, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Not... There is, there is self-supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised. So first of all, self-supervised and unsupervised are, are often in a interchangeable. Uh, in fact, what we do here is, is semi-supervised because so part of it, we have training data and part of it, we add self-supervision. Um, but there is a difference between uh, self-supervised and uns maybe, maybe let me okay unsupervised uh is, is a little bit different uh if but i'm not sure that uh people in the community would make the distinction that i made uh self-supervised is people often refer to it as uh the network is supervised with a lot of data but i don't a person doesn't have to provide the supervision the person doesn't have uh to to give a label okay so for example the uh lots of uh, the training the the network on lots of pairs of high resolution, low resolution images, people would often say that it's self-supervised because you take the high resolution image, you scale it down and you give it uh, uh, as a pair to the, to the network. You don't have to work hard to generate, uh, to create this uh, uh, data set, okay? So people would often say this is self-supervision or you take a uh, black and white, uh, um, but it's not it's not self supervised it's it, it's it, it's self supervised in the sense that the person didn't have to give it a label, but as I said, it's not self supervised in the sense that you had to give it additional uh, training examples. When I said totally unsupervised, I meant there were no prior examples. Okay, but that's my own terminology of totally unsupervised. Or okay. Okay, uh, great, great, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Excellent, very nice. Thank you, Michal. I, um, Ron Maidan has um, noted uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you um, very much. Um, as you were talking, my mind wandered to letter perception. For example, the letter A is always the same, but the letters D, B, P, Q uh, can be very confusing. So I'm not sure precisely uh, what, uh, but, but, but my thoughts are that he probably meant that it would be interesting to see how the algorithm performs on text. And I mean, it sounds like it can do very well. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, that's what I, I, I guess. Um, and Galit, you very, Galit, you're probably, you're here. So do you wanna ask or should I read your, uh, the, 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 the question? Great talk. Um, so I was wondering whether V1 representations are image-based. So you would think that they wouldn't generalize as well then relative to the high level visual areas which are generate category based representation and it's very difficult for me to understand you Gulit. maybe maybe Sharon, can you maybe read the question it's somehow... yeah okay um so Gulit says wouldn't you expect that image reconstruction based on higher visual areas that generate a category based representation would generalize better to untrained images than v1 voxels that generate an image based representation Definitely, I would. I, I, here we check this. I, I, by the way, I agree with you, Galit. I think, if I understand the question, is uh, we had two tasks. One is the reconstruction, and here I'm showing you the effect of the different brain regions on the reconstruction. Um, the other is um, the uh, semantic interpretation. Uh, and you're asking whether the higher visual cortex uh, adds more to the semantic. Actually, we didn't check this. Okay. Uh, I suspect they would have more influence. The only reason I'm hesitant to say yes is because their signal-to-noise ratio is so poor. I'm not sure, uh, uh, even for that, whether just the low level, I, I don't know. We didn't check that. But uh, if anything, they're likely to contribute more to the high-level uh, perception. Mm -hmm. yes. So just, just to follow up to Galit's question, I mean, Maybe it makes sense within this context that the signal to noise level is poor in terms of image reconstruction if what they aim to represent is the category rather than the image. So it would be a, 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 a well, partially informative, but not very accurate for reconstructing the image. But no, no, but the, the signal to noise. Talking about 
The signal to noise ratio was checked at the fMRI level, not at the image reconstruction level. We checked whether a voxel, how consistent it is across the 35 different readings, okay, how, how much it fluctuates in different images. If it's, you know, if it's the same in all images, it's not an interesting voxel. But mm -hmm. if it's a voxel that fluctuates a lot across images, yet it's very consistent across the, the 35 different readings, it means it's very informative. Okay, so that's how we computed the signal to noise ratio and uh, determined which voxels are more uh, informative and which are less. Mm -hmm. And, and that's I... nothing to do with image reconstruction. Okay. Did, did you also try to get um, classification from humans or you think that the, you know, AlexNet would classify better the reconstructed images? So, right, you only try to classify it with AlexNet, right? Not, with, not by humans. We did. Uh, you mean look at the images and say what the reconstructed images and say what they are? Right. By the way, even AlexNet will not do a good job. We just use the intermediate layer of AlexNet as a signature and use that because AlexNet, as I said, the final levels will not be good from AlexNet either because AlexNet was trained on natural images, not on these strange things. Uh, right. Sure, sure. Um, and if you use a uh, verification instead of classification, um, uh, would that, you know, help you? Verification, um, you mean uh, what? Like um, the distance between the reconstructed images and, you know, the real uh, ground truth images and see... Uh, a difference? Uh, the, the distance. Mm -hmm. The difference, I mean, if you take this a goldfish, the reconstructed goldfish, and take a mm -hmm. different, this image, uh, all the pixels will flash out, including the fish. I mean, the difference, I mean, the pixel level difference is going to be huge, right? right, I mean, right. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the pixels. I'm talking about the, the high level representation that you, you can get from the so network. And, right. So that's all we're doing. That's how we're doing the classification. We're taking the intermediate layer of the network, which is supposed to be not the <laughs> high level label, but not also the pixel level. That's okay. the assumption. And that's what we're comparing, but we're not comparing it image to image, we're comparing it against class representation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Michal, do you have time to answer another question? Because I see that Sarit has a question. Sure, I have time. Okay, Sarit. I, uh, I just wanted to ask about the, the first part. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the, uh, Originally, you take a high resolution image, or previously, what people have done was to take high resolution images, make them low, and then produce high again. Yeah. And then uh, that's how they measure the how good quality uh, the algorithm works. So I'm wondering if you, at any point here, take a human observer uh, to examine if the quality has improved. So there's a big difference between what's known as perceptual similarity and metric similarity. In fact, there is a real nice work of uh, Tomil Michaeli from the Technion who shows that there is an inherent trade-off between the two. If you improve the perceptual similarity, you actually hurt the metric similarity and vice versa. Uh, these never go, people tried always to improve them together. You cannot improve them together. One, there's a trade-off between the two. Uh, it's a very interesting paper. It's called the perceptual distortion trade-off. Uh, if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, here, we the, the way we measured things is two ways. One is using uh, a metric evaluation, but we tried not to do it at a pixel level, as I said, at an intermediate level with perceptual similarity between deep features. But the other thing we did was we used, that's why we did it with the Amazon Mechanical Turk with human raters, which gave us the perceptual, oh, you're not talking about the fMRI. Yeah, but the first part with when you increase the resolution, like you showed us the yes, 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 yes. yes. I'm wondering. So there, there we measured PSNR, which is a, a metric, a metric often used in super resolution. Uh, it's not. It wasn't perceptual similarity. It was. It was. A, it was a, a metric which is standard to use in super resolution. But as I said, uh, this doesn't always conform with. Uh, human uh, perception. And so uh, just a quick follow up. Do you know of like dissociations between this? Like uh, if you imagine like this metric being different than what a human observer would say. And so, like- So uh, so here's the thing. Um, 
as a, so what one okay one of the things uh, that uh, um, for, okay it's it could be different for example if I show you uh, an Escher like image which has lots of repetitions and so on okay uh, you see a balcony. It's obvious to you that there should be handrails there because you see a different balcony with a much larger scale with handrails. Okay, but the input image didn't have an, a hand uh, uh, um, rail a handrails there because it was already in intermediate quality, and so a, 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 a human observer would actually expect there to be something different than maybe what's there in the ground truth image. And when you do metric similarity. It will be different than what's uh, or or if I take a low resolution image of a grass and generate a high resolution image of it, a person will maybe uh, uh, the high resolution grass. The person doesn't care about which direction the strands of the, of the grass go into. As far as it's concerned, all these are perceptually similar in terms of high quality. But for the uh, metric similarity, it expects it to be exactly at the right angle. It could be blurrier, but as long as it's got an edge in the right angle, it will give it a higher uh, uh, similarity uh, score versus where a person, if you had a sharp uh, grass strand, which stands in the wrong uh, angle, a person would say that's a great looking image, but metric wise, it would be uh, harmful. So these are differences that, uh, you know, inherent differences. But we used only, uh, 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 we trained the network, of course, using, oh, you have to train the network with something metric. So it was trained with uh, NSC. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Michal, do you have another? I mean, I actually have two questions, but I might also ask you in the email. So is it okay that I ask it? Oh, I prefer I prefer to uh, to answer now than, than have okay. a whole thing. <laughs> sure. Um, so I want to ask about the scaling of the first part, the where you uh, basically used um, the algorithm to enhance resolution, whether uh, you can perform it at any scale or does the image uh, dictate the scale that you can enlarge the image and enhance the resolution or can you just uh, go as high, well not as high, I mean I assume the noise builds up as much as further as you go from the original image, but still, what uh, what can you say about the scales that you can enhance the resolution to? Okay, so as I said, you take the image and you scale it down, and that's how you train your network. Now, of course, if your image initially is too small, yeah, you scale it down, you're left with nothing. Yeah. So this limits, of course, how much you can scale it down. What we do in order to be able to increase the resolution more than just a factor of two and so on, is we gradually increase the resolution. We yeah. take an image, let's say we want to increase it by a factor of four. We can't decrease it by a factor of four for two reasons. First of all, we're, le we're left with no meat, but also the recurrence of patches across scales tends to be stronger across uh, nearby scales than across very distant scales. So what we do is we scale it down a bit. We train it. Let's say we scale it by three quarters. And yeah. then we increase the resolution by four over three. Okay. And now we add this to our training examples. And now we can scale also those new things more and so on. That's how we gradually increase the resolution. We obtained high super resolutions with this algorithm by a factor of four or eight, but that's stretching it eight. It would be stretching it. There are external methods today that can increase the resolution by a factor of 32 or whatever. Wow. But again, these are externally trained and I suspect that they're restricted to the type of training uh, and the uh, statistics of the training data they have. But I haven't checked that. Wonderful. Um, okay, I have another question about uh, memory, whether you think that when you recognize an image that you've already seen, would that also uh, but I have to think about how I phrase the question, so I'll leave it to some other time in the future. <laughs> okay. No, I, I mean, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask me afterwards. Yeah, but I, I, have to, <laughs> no. I have to think how the encoding and decoding uh, would work if you can use that to, uh, to test whether this is really uh, something of a, a recall. Can, can, if you train the network on a previously seen image and the, and, and the activation of the current image, whether you can then um, uh, decide if really this is a, a no, but okay, I'll, I'll leave it because I have to think uh, further. Um, 
pinpoint the question. So um, I'd like to thank you again. One short question, just one. <laughs> okay. So it, it, it has to do with your answer to, uh, to actually to believe in Tumi. Saying that... It's difficult to, to understand you, Mirav. You, you sound as if you talk underwater. <laughs> okay. Should I, I shall try. If it doesn't work, I'll either write it. Is it, is it better now? I'm closer. It's... Is it better? Is it only me who who has difficulty understanding the love? Or um, I think well, I, I think I think it's okay. I mean, I can. Okay. Okay. So if I don't understand you, then uh, Sharon will. Uh, uh... Yeah, I'll 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 mediate. So. Okay. So you said you said uh, in response to Galit and to me that if I understood you correctly, that voxels in high level regions have poor signal to noise in the sense that they're more variable and responding to the same picture, right? Mm -hmm. So this is very, I mean, for me, it's very surprising. And I wonder if it's about, if you can tell whether it's about the actual brain regions or about something in how reliable data acquisition is conducted. Because if it's about the brain regions, it's, it's very revealing. So this is why I think it's interesting. It's in this data set. That's what I can say. It's it's the data in this data set. I don't know. I wasn't involved in the acquisition, and I have no idea whether it's a problem with the acquisition or whether it's an inherent uh, problem. Uh, you know, um, I don't know. Thanks. Um, Michal, is it? There's another question. I see that Aliran raised his hand. Is it okay that he asks? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Aliran. Um, uh, we can ask it from the chat. So I wonder if it's oh, it's it's possible to gain enough data uh, for mobile uh, devices and to execute the uh, method. For if it's enough data for what? So 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 uh, is it possible to do um, the part two? Sorry about my English. For mobile devices, mm. um, I can. Uh, he's asking whether you think the algorithm will work for data, not only for fMRI data, but let's say for EEG, mobile oh. EEG or mobile fNIRs or such devices. Um, whether the resolution would be too poor to res to, uh, if I understand correctly, um, from what uh, Eliran wrote in the chat. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I would love to apply it to other types of uh, data. I have no experience with that. But that was, if you saw, I asked, uh, can we apply it to EEG or things like that? I don't know. EEG, of course, has much poorer spatial resolution, much better temporal resolution, but uh, I have no idea. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring and uh, wonderful uh, talk. And um, I, so again, many thanks and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we, we are going to take, uh, so happy holidays to everyone, everyone who's watching uh, or celebrating and we'll be back on January uh, 11th with uh, Ramona Will from UCL. Uh, we'll publish the information later. So we are taking a tour, let's say, we'll be back in three weeks. Um, so thank you again. Happy <laughs> and, New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> yes. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy 22. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.